ASMR. If you ever watch my first video on this channel, uh, I kind of go into a breakdown of the name of the channel, Ren10, and in it I talk about how I want this channel to have 10 aspects to it, like 10 different categories of ASMR that I do. And obviously just due to time, I have only really explored two of these aspects, one being NFL and the other being sports betting. So today I decided I'm going to step into a third category. Uh, this will be the ASMR lecture segment that I mentioned in that video. It's kind of like lessons on random things. Uh, I think in the lecture category I will eventually do a series about how American football works because I got that as a request one time and I think it's a great idea for a video installment or series but I do think I'll wait until like I have more free time or until football is not in season since I have like a set routine of videos that I'm putting out right now um, but yeah for today's video uh, the ASMR lecture is a bit different it's completely random this is basically just like if you're in need of an ASMR video or you just want to hear ASMR uh, this will be basically be me reading some of my class readings for college uh, I'm in this class which is about Filipino American religions and I have some readings due before I go to class in like a couple hours that I have not started so I figured why not just whisper them out loud. I'm not the best at reading. I cannot speed read that well. Uh, I do prefer to read, read by uh, word by word for like information retention. Uh, obviously, that doesn't always happen. If I'm reading a book, I'll probably like spark notes, uh, things like that. I get by in most of my classes, but I figured why not? I'm going to be reading it anyways, and I prefer to read aloud, so I'll try it out. So yeah, that's today's video. You'll learn about the Philippines in particular and its first contacts of the Philippines. Uh, in this class, we've kind of learned that like not much is known about the Philippines in terms of their history before the Spanish arrived. They don't have a lot of literature or text evidence from back then, so lots of speculation and guesswork. And so we're going to be learning about the first contacts for the Philippines today. Uh, first, I'll start off by giving you an outline of my three readings. Reading number one is by Sao Rugua, and it is roughly, uh, like a rough translation of the reading is Gazette Gazetteer of Foreign Lands. This link will send you to the top page of this translation. Read the translator's notes and then scroll down to sections 56, Mai, 57, The Three Islands, and 58, Bululu. Uh, you can ignore the gray notes, which are translators' clarifications. Pay attention to what items, actions, and details seem important to Zhao. So that is reading number one. After that, I have reading number two by Antonio Pigafetta. It's called First Voyage Around the World. Uh, the instructions are, scroll down, read the preface for a summary of the text, then scroll down to page 103, Saturday, March 13th, 1521, and browse about to page 167. Note, page numbers are in light gray on the right margins in parentheses, and the text per page is short. Picavetta was the Italian scholar who accompanied Magellan in 1519 on the planned voyage around the world. Magellan was killed by a local chief, uh, Silap 
This is a complete annotated translation of part one of the Sufan Si, an early 13th century ethnographic and geographical description of nearly 60 foreign countries known to the Chinese through maritime trade relations, as well as a couple of imaginary countries that appear to be based on Arab myths. Part two, which I have now translated, describes many of the foreign trade commodities mentioned in part one and ends with the description of Hainan Island, which was under Chinese rule but still regarded as semi-barbaric frontier region. The author, a Southern Song official named Zhao Rikuo or Zhao Rikuo, composed this text in uh, 1224 to 1225 based on information gathered from earlier Chinese sources and from foreign merchants whom he had interviewed. He had never traveled out of South China, but was stationed in the major port of uh, Guangzhou. as a supervisor of maritime trade. Note that the second character in the author's given name is pronounced Gua in Taiwanese, uh, Mandarin in Taiwanese Mandarin, but Gua in mainland Chinese Mandarin. Both pronunciations are acceptable, but I have to use, I have chosen to use Guo in this translation. For a recent study of the extant sources of Zhao's life, see Ilya S. Conan. Some thoughts. Uh, oh, okay, I don't care. The only full translation of this text in English was published in 1911. Friedrich Earth and William Wood Woodville Rockhill. For a recent study on the background and ideological ramifications of it. Bro, I do not care. I, I don't care about these translators' notes. I just turned this off. Why is it still playing noise? Okay, I'm so sorry. Discord chimes. I'm just going to skip to section 56 now. Uh, thank you for sticking with me. So, this chapter is called Mai or Mindoro Orbe. The country of Mai is to the north of Boni, otherwise known as Borneo. More than a thousand families live in a single settlement on both sides of a river. The local wear either a sheet of cotton cloth like a cloak or just cotton loincloth. There are bronze statues of the Buddha scattered in fields of grass, but no one knows where they are from. There are, th there are few bandits in this country. Upon arriving at its shores, the merchant ship will enter its harbor in moor in front of the official marketplace where all trade in this country takes place. The local people board the ship and mix freely with the crew. The chiefs here use white parasols daily, so merchants always present such parasols to them as parting gifts. Trading starts with the barbarian merchants coming in large groups and carrying goods away on bamboo rafts. Initially, the Chinese merchants do not understand what is going on, and only gradually do they come to recognize the faces of the men carrying the goods. Yet, there is never any loss of goods through theft. The barbarian merchants take the goods to other islands and sell them. They usually return after eight or nine months and pay the ship merchants their share of the profit. Some return later than expected, and that is why ships go to Mai to trade. To, uh, that's why ships that go to Mai to trade take the longest to come back. Vassal states of this country include the three islands, Palawan and the Kalamian Islands, uh, Baipuyan, the Babuyan Islands, Pulilu, or Polilo Island, Liandong, possibly Lingayan Gulf, Lushin, possibly Luzon, and Lihan, possibly Lian. This land produces what uh, various proposed locations for Mai and its vassal states. 
states of my uh, Mindoro orbit. They are called Geomayan, Kalamian, uh, Palau, Palawan, and Bajinong, possibly Baswanga. Each has its own peoples living scattered along among the islands. When merchant ships arrive, they come out to trade. They are collectively called the Three Islands. I apologize if I am butchering these names. Uh, I have never said them aloud, much less whispered them before, so it is a little bit of a struggle. Their customs are essentially the same as those of the Mai. Each settlement includes about a thousand families. The terrain is very mountainous, with range after range of steep cliffs like walls. The local people live on high and inaccessible ground for safety, building houses out of rushes. There is no water in the mountains, so the women balance two or three stack pitchers on their heads to get water from the rivers. When they go back up into the mountains, with their jugs filled, they walk as surely as if on level ground. In the remote valleys of these islands, there live another kind of people called the Haidan or the Ada. They are small in stature with round yellow eyes, curly hair, and prominent teeth. They live in nests in the treetops. Sometimes they form bands of three to five and wait in ambush in the undergrowth to shoot arrows at people passing through. Many people have thus have been thus killed by them, but if one throws a porcelain bowl at them, they will stoop down, pick it up, and run away, leaping and shouting with joy. Whenever foreign merchants arrive at a settlement, they dare not go ashore immediately. Instead, they weigh, anchor in midstream, and beat drums to attract the locals. Barbarian merchants then race to the ship in small canoes, bringing with them kapok, beeswax, native cloth, and coir, a matting to trade with the foreign merchants. If they cannot agree on a price, then the chief of the merchants comes himself to negotiate. The foreign merchants give him presents of silk parasols, porcelain vessels, and rattan baskets. Excuse me. One or two local men remain on the ships as hostages, while the foreign merchants go ashore to trade. Once the trading is concluded, the hostages are handed over. Every merchant ship only stops for three or four days before moving on to another settlement. The barbarians live along the shores of the three islands, and every settlement is independent of the other. Excuse me again. Sorry, there was some carbonation in the drink I drank earlier. My bad. Their mountains or islands run in a northeastern direction, and when the southwest wind blows in, great waves dash against the mountains or islands. The breakers roll so fast that ships cannot anchor there securely. For that reason, merchants coming to trade in the three islands usually prepare to make their return voyage in the fourth or fifth lunar month. When trading in this country, merchants use porcelain ware, black damask, resist dyed silk, five colored burn beads, lead fishnet weights, and refined tin. And the third of the three sections, Pulilo or Polilo Island. Pulilo is connected to the three islands and its settlements are slightly larger. Many of its people are fierce and violent given to pillaging and banditry. There are many coral, ri coral reefs in this in the sea in these parts. There are undulating surfaces looking like withered tree trunks or knife blades. The reefs are sharper than swords and halberds. The ships passing by them must be prepared to maneuver sharply to avoid them. This place produces blue lung coral and coral trees, red coral, but these are extremely hard to obtain. The local customs and trade goods are the same as those of the three islands. Oh, Alright, I am done with my first reading. Uh, as a reminder, that was a Chinese gazetteer of foreign lands. Next.
Cow. Moving on to reading number two, First Voyage Around the World. So for this one, I am supposed to read the preface, which is a summary, and then scroll to page 103. So let's see. Preface. In this and the succeeding volume, we present various documents, notably the relation of Antonio Picavetta, which could not be obtained in season for publication in regular chronological order, and which it has seemed advisable to insert as addenda at this point. With the present volume is begun the publication of, it, of Antonio Picavetta's relation to the first circumnavigation of the world, the greatest single achievement in all history of sea exploration and discovery. Written by a participant of the expedition, Picavetta's relation has a greater value than any other narrative of the voyage. Its great value, and the fact that it has never been adequately presented to English-speaking public, has induced the editors to insert this relation in the present series, both in original Italian, rigidly adhering to and preserving all the peculiarities of the original manuscript, and in English translation. This relation is especially valuable for its descriptions of the various peoples, countries, and products of the Oriental Seas, and for its vocabularies, as well as for its account of the first circumnavigation. From its very nature, the relation has been called for unusual amount of annotation, which has been drawn freely from various sources. Chiefly, Bosto's annotations and his publication of Picavetta's relation in Part 5, Volume 3. Of the Raccolta di Documenti di Studi, published by Royal Columbian Commission of the Fourth Senatenary of Discovery of America under the auspices of the Minister's Public Instruction. Publication of the original Italian in English, page for page, renders it necessary to place the annotations at the end of the volume instead of in footnote as hitherto. The various charts of the Italian manuscript are all presented in a facsimile in the course of the work, in order that the various peculiarities of the manuscript might be preserved. It has been necessary to specifically design and cast certain characters that appear in Picavetta's narrative. None of these characters have been reproduced by Mausto, who also writes out all abbreviations. Throughout, we have aimed to present the document as it exists in the Bibliotheca Ambrosiana, even to the spacing of the words, with the exception that paragraphs in the manuscript begin with a hanging indentation and usually end with a series of dots and dashes. A brief synopsis of the relation follows. After a brief dedication to the Grand Master of the Hospitaller Knights of Rhodes or Malta, as they were called later, and of which he order he is a member, Picavetta relates that, being in Barcelona in 1519 with Babal Legate, he first hears the expedition about to set out under Magales. Magales? I think that's Miguel. Being desirous of seeing the world, he gains permission to accompany the expedition and soon joins the fleet at Seville, whence it is to depart. Magellus, a wise commander, issues his instructions to the various commanders of vessels airport is left, so that they may keep together in the unknown seas before them, and that they may act in harmony. Setting sail from Seville on August 10th, 1519, a fleet of five small vessels starts on its long journey amid salvos of artillery. At the mouth of the Guadalquivir, San Lugar de Barameda, they anchor until September 20th, when setting sail once more, they make for the Canaries, which are reached September 26th. There, they are reprovisioned and taking their departure on October 3rd, 
coast southward along uh, Africa amid alternating claims of violent storms, cheered, however, by the welcome operation of St. Elmo's fire, which promises them safety until they cross the line. Thereupon, taking a general westerly course, the Cape of St. Augustine on Brazilian coast is soon sighted. The fresh provisions, so essential to sea voyages, are procured on the coast of Brazil, where occurs the first, first, where occurs the first communication with the natives, with whom wonderful bargains are made. Those Indians, cannibals, thought they be, uh, in whom Picavetta describes briefly, not failing to inscribe some of their language, receive mariners hospitali receive mariners hospitably, and thinking that the latter are come to remain among them, build them a home. But after a stay of eighteen days, the sails are again trimmed down towards south, and descending the coast, Magales anchors next at Rio de la Plata, which had formerly proved so disastrous to Juan de Solis and his men. Unable here to hold converse with the anthropophagus natives who flee at their approach, the fleet retakes its course, anchoring at two islands where many sea wolves and penguins are taken, and thus fresh food is obtained. The next anchorage is at the famous bay of St. Julian, along the desolate Patagonian coast, where for five months they winter. For two months, not an individual is seen, but one day they gain their first sight of in uh, sight of the Patagonians, whose huge bulk strikes all with surprise, and who are held as giants. Amicable relations are entered into. Sorry, amicable relations are entered into with various of these wandering Indians, and finally. Magales, with taste for the wonder of all that characterized his period, as strongly, or more strongly than our own, determines to capture two of them and take them back to Spain as novelties. His ruse is successful, but an attempt to indose the wife of one of the Indians to go to the ship fails. Very interesting are these giants to the curious Picavetta, and to him is due to the earliest description of their manners and customs and the earliest specimens of their language. These two captured giants are placed in separate vessels, but unfortunately they both die here, reaching the end of the journey, one in a deserting ship, San Antonio, and the other in Magales' own ship, the Trinidad. Dude, how long is this reading? Object of the first half of the expedition is attained. 
namely the discovery of the strait, which occurs October 21st, 1520. The strait is 110 leguas long. It is one half legua broad, more or less. Its discovery is due to the indomitable energy and endurance of Michaelis and his certain knowledge, probably overstated by Picaveta, of its existence. Continuing, Picaveta briefly narrates that the passage through the state strait and the desertion of San Antonio, which returns to Spain after putting the captain Alvaro de Mesquita, a relative of Magueles, in irons. For the pilot, a Portuguese named Esteban Gomez, is jealous of Magueles, as the latter's expedition has destroyed ambitious plans of his own. The other three ships, leaving letters and signals in the strait in case San Antonio tries to regain them, proceeds on its way, debouching from the strait on November 28th, then begins a long voyage over the trackless Pacific, in truth very Pacific, and all three ships sail on steadily for two and three for three and two-thirds months without being able to great provision to the horrors of famine and are added in the suffering of dreaded scurvy. Picaveta, whose curiosity is always alert and active and who remains well, diverts himself with talking to Patagonian, who is finally baptized, but who is one of those to die in the vast stretch of, from the strait to Ladrones, first seen by them of all Europeans. Only two islands, both desert, are sighted, and those, since they are unable to find anchorage there, are called the Unfortunate Isles. Picaveta mentions the southern constellation Crux, and the star clouds called after Michaelis. His geographical information, as one might expect, is not always accurate, for he places Sipangu, or Japan, in the open Pacific. Thoughts of relief that come upon sighting various islands, which they are the Ladrones because of the thievishness of the inhabitants, are quickly dissipated by the hostility they are accounted. So bold are these natives, whose appearance, life, and customs, Picaveta describes briefly, that they even steal the ship's boat from the stern of the <laughs> Trinidad, thus necessitating a raid into one of the islands where some of the natives are killed and some of the houses are burned, but the boat is recovered. Bro, I'm not getting through this. These paragraphs are brutal. Uh, yeah, GG's. Maybe I move on to the third one. I didn't even get to the part where he talks about the Philippines. Good God. Uh, maybe I skip ahead a little bit. Mazava, where Enrique the Malay. 
African slave of Michaelis serves as an interpreter. Amicable relations are speedily entered into uh, and confirmed by the Malayan rite of blood brotherhood. The king of Limassol and his brother, the king of certain districts in Mindanao, prove most helpful and are completely won over by a judicious presentation of gifts. Greatly are natives impressed by the power of newcomers as seen in the artillery and armor, and their astonishment is increased when Michaelis relates his course to their islands and the discovery of the stream. Alright everyone, that is it. I am tired of reading, and the classroom that I am sitting in seems to... I don't know if people are passing by it or waiting to enter it, but either way, I am afraid, so I'm gonna stop here. Uh, thanks for watching. If you like stuff like this, I would be pretty confused, to be honest. I, I would be very surprised if anyone made it to the end of this video. Um, but there's nothing wrong with that. This is just like general ASMR. It's just uh, pretty starkly different from my regular content on this channel. So if you like stuff like this, let me know. Maybe I'll read more of my readings in a whispered voice.